This is lecture one, part three, of an overview of principles and issues in oral rehabilitation. We're picking up here at slide uh, number 23. So as I transition to the next slide, that should align with the slide set that you have. We're continuing on here in answering the who, what, when, where, why, and how of oral rehabilitation. So uh, the next area here is, uh, is when, when do we do oral rehabilitation? And as the slide indicates, uh, we do oral rehabilitation, provide these kinds of services all across the lifespan, infancy through the elderly. And typically that's the way uh, audiologic services are from a point of view of the rehabilitative services anyway. Uh, audiologists provide hearing assessment, hearing diagnostic services, you know, literally all across the lifespan, uh, um, uh, infants, children, middle-aged uh, adults, and uh, older adults. But primarily the, uh, the, uh, re the rehabilitative aspects uh, tend to be on both ends of the age spectrum. Um, I mean, obviously that's not a, uh, a complete uh, generality, but uh, you got the basic idea. So uh, when we think about uh, the, uh, the, 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 the people we serve, we think first about infants. And so um, we have uh, a great deal of emphasis placed on working with infants and young children. Um, we have advanced technology now uh, with uh, cochlear implants, uh, with diagnostic procedures. Uh, we have uh, early identification uh, through uh, early hearing detection and, uh, and intervention programs uh, that are pretty much national uh, sort of the health policy. Um, so we're detecting children at a much earlier age, uh, hopefully right at uh, within the first couple of days of birth. And then we have different uh, areas of technology that are available to them. In addition to that, we also have a higher survival rate of children who, um, uh, for lack of a better word, would be otherwise challenged uh, and might not have survived in earlier medical times. Uh, so we've got children who are going to be survivors of uh, very challenging uh, initial uh, medical conditions. Uh, and very likely, uh, hearing loss may be part of uh, their package of challenges. Um, so, in, uh, infants is a, is a, is a very uh, intense time of working with um, the rehabilitative, habilitative procedures uh, with uh, hearing. Uh, School-age children um, are going to be a, a ubiquitous part of caseloads uh, with more and more um, children with hearing impairment uh, becoming mainstreamed, even children with um, a nominally profound, severe to profound hearing loss, they're going to be in uh, mainstream classrooms. So um, speech language pathologists and teachers uh, will encounter them. So uh, this will involve uh, not only specific uh, educational and speech language planning, but also considerations of classroom acoustics and pullout services and, and lots and lots of other stuff. And we'll uh, deal with that later in the course as well. We talk about audio, uh, adults, rather, that audiologists serve. Um, the main feature when we think about oral rehabilitation is to find workplace and community uh, issues that need to be addressed. Um, as you may notice, if you take a look at the Hearing Loss magazine, uh, most of the cover uh, shots and, and many of the stories uh, deal with younger to middle-aged adults, and that's you know, probably correct that this is the population that uh, is most vulnerable uh, economically uh, due to their hearing loss and, uh, and other types of um, challenges and discriminations that may be uh, uh, in their pathway. So, uh, so workplace and to try to have uh, to ensure that uh, adults with hearing impairment can be um, can have an acceptable workplace and, and uh, be maximally employed, all that kind of stuff is important. Uh, finally, we get to older people. And with older people, uh, again, if we accept the model that we're dealing primarily with adults with adult onset hearing loss, uh, we're talking about then sort of uh, either the, the restoration and certainly the maintenance of what their you know, earlier in life communication abilities had been. Um, as with many other aspects of, of aging, uh, you know, our goals are sort of consistent with those, which is to say that we'd like to have our older adults be continue to be active community participants, uh, for them to stay in the workplace as long as they would like to, uh, and uh, to uh, engage in, in healthier lifestyles. So that's all part of, uh, part of uh, dealing with older, older people. 
What do we do in oral rehab? So I'm listing here uh, some overarching uh, purposes uh, of oral rehab. And, and over the, the next few slides, we'll talk about some of the specific things that uh, are done to achieve these overarching purposes. So here at slide 25, I'm just sort of laying out a couple sort of three big issue kinds of things. And the next couple of slides following that sort of talk about how we how we might go about doing that. So we think about it, uh, uh, what's our over overall purpose of uh, doing oral rehabilitation? Uh, as you see here, point number one, to assist a person to reach their optimum communication potential, regardless of age. So children, adults, whatever the case may be. Uh, point number two is to improve a person's communication function. Um, and again, the communication function, the words uh, there sort of uh, are classic oral rehab words, but simply mean that we want to provide uh, the, the, the best communicative efficiency, the best uh, communicative fluency for the person with uh, hearing impairment and their communicative partners. Third, to overcome problems that are imposed by the hearing loss, by the hearing impairment, and also by the environment. And uh, in that process, to enhance um, persons with hearing losses, participation in life and society. So we had talked uh, in, in slide set two, I believe, um, uh, in part two of lecture one. Uh, we talked about um, the ICF terminology, which in this case would be to reduce activity limitations and uh, to reduce participation restrictions that would be imposed by the hearing impairment. And we'll deal with that in more specific terms as we move through the course. But that's, that's the sort of the contemporary way to articulate that. So what do we do? Sort of in a way, how do we do it? Really, this is a more how do we do uh, oral rehab? What are the things that we do? First and foremost, the, the primary uh, activity in oral rehab is going to tend to be uh, the provision of, oral re uh, of uh, hearing aid services. So when we think about um, uh, the majority, the primary service that we do, it's fitting hearing aids fi uh, primarily. So amplification devices would include not only personal hearing aids, but also would include assistive listening devices. Um, some might be uh, special for spe uh, specific circumstances like television, uh, telephone, that sort of thing. But in, in addition to that would be um, other, other kinds of remedies that would involve amplification systems. But primarily what we're talking about here is we're talking about personal hearing aids. So PHA or personal hearing aid is the, is the sort of the, the primary uh, activity that we do. Now, in addition to that, uh, a lot of what we do also in oral rehabilitation is provide counseling, provide information. Um, and so that, uh, you know, would typically follow uh, diagnostic evaluation, and then that would be then followed up with sort of here's, here's what you need to do. So we provide information to people about what their uh, options might be. Uh, a significant part of, of what we do in oral rehabilitation is to provide support for family members uh, and uh, significant others. So uh, depending on the family unit and the person in question, it could be a spouse, could be a parent. Um, so it really uh, uh, depends. Sometimes it's a child. Uh, very often middle-aged children of older adults are responsible in a greater way than they had ever imagined uh, to uh, provide uh, for, you know, for care and oversight of their aging parent. Um, uh, in addition, some other sort of skills-based things that uh, audiologists might do and, and actually speech language pathologists might do also is to provide communication training uh, using enhancement of auditory channel. We would call that auditory training. And also then ch uh, training through using the visual channel. We're going to call that ultimately, we'll call that speech reading. See if I can spell that out here. That's not most efficient, but you got the basic idea. And we'll have a whole lecture on speech reading uh, and visual communication uh, later on in the course. Other things that we do uh, would include referrals to others as needed. Um, and, and again, uh, one of the uh, assignments that you're going to do for this course will be to kind of put together a, uh, a resource booklet that would be uh, sort of useful for you to provide to, uh, to families um, of uh, parents with hearing impairment uh, in their child. And so we'll talk about uh, who would be a good group of people that uh, this family would need to know. So we'll have you working on that a little bit. Non-medical management of tinnitus. Tinnitus is a, a perception of a sound in the, uh, in the ear, in the head that doesn't seem to be aligned with anything in the environment. And so audiologists are more, more and more doing that. I'd reference you also to take a look at the SCOW and NURBIN Table 1-4 for their oral rehab model, which is an acronym here, CORE and CARE. So just take a look at that and see how that kind of aligns with the kinds of material I'm do talking about here. So we get down to um, some uh, issues and principles in oral rehab. So we talk about challenges and opportunities. Uh, we'll get through a couple of these here. Um, and... Uh, 
in slide set uh, part four, we'll get to uh, some of the rest of this, but, but it, we'll, we'll get through at least a couple of these here over the next uh, few minutes. Uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, the primary uh, challenge and opportunity, I would say, would be uh, the demand for adult-based services that's tied to the aging of America. We've got two groups of people that are contributing to the aging population, to the, to the older population. The people who are already old, uh, getting older, uh, and this is uh, largely due to advances in preventative um, uh, health care and, and, and better uh, access and, uh, to health care and uh, immunizations of diseases that pr in prior uh, decades and centuries had been devastating. So there's a, a, a larger group of old people getting older. So that's one. Then the other group is a group of baby boomers, the people that are born from 1946 to 1964, uh, now becoming baby geezers. Now, I did a little article uh, that I put in uh, your uh, reading packet or in, you know, on the Moodle site rather uh, that kind of talks about some of the demographics of uh, aging and specifically in, in California. So take a look at that because that will expand a little bit on these points uh, in a, a little bit freer time that you have. Secondly, um, there's going to be an increased number of cochlear implants only because the criteria is going to be sort of expanding. Uh, once upon a time it was a very limited group of people who could be considered for a cochlear implant but that uh, that seems to be changing. And cochlear implants are not only a child device, but they're also an adult device as well. Additionally, um, there's going to be, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, an increase in the fragile pediatric group for children who uh, now survive that might not have. Uh, other challenges that face uh, the completion of oral rehabilitation would be uh, changing and increasing technology and keeping up with changes in technology. Development of multicultural society is going to be a particularly uh, uh, pertinent factor here in, in, uh, in California anyway, where I'm speaking from. Um, and so it's going to be very important that we have practitioners who uh, come from and serve the communities uh, uh, that, they, uh, that they came out of. Um, all uh, another aspect that's going on uh, that's throughout healthcare, as you're no doubt aware, uh, is the notion of, of cost cutting, cost shifting, and general um, accountability. Uh, people are going to have to demonstrate that what they do is, uh, in fact, a uh, a beneficial sort of uh, as a beneficial uh, activity. Um, a specific problem, again, maybe more so here in California, is that there's going to be uh, a fewer number of audiologists because there's only one doctoral program in California. Uh, and so there's going to be fewer and fewer audiologists trained in California to work in California. And the penultimate challenge and what will conclude this particular um, screencast is the idea that um, there are uh, all the people who would be potential candidates for hearing aids uh, only about 20% of them, 20% actually get hearing aids. Um, this population we can call the unamplified has been uh, stable at this uh, about 20% market share for decades. So uh, it sort of implies that despite changes in technology, improvements in hearing aids, that um, still the majority of people, 80% who could benefit from hearing aids, still don't uh, obtain them. And this is a major feature, a major uh, concern for the hearing aid industry uh, and for audiologists as well. All right, so that concludes uh, part three. Uh, let's uh, move on to part four.